okay, it's live now. You kind of pull your screen down, it'll go live for you. And then you click on it. Okay, it's live now. Um, pull your screen down. Hi. Hi. I think we're just waiting for um, Kelly to join us. So. Kelly, if you need some help, let me know. You're muted on, on your computer. OK, so I'm. I see you guys, and I they're alive, but you can't see me or hear me. So they have to. So if you click the plus button at the bottom, they're alive, but you can't see me or hear me. So they Hi, everybody. We're just waiting for one other person to join us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just bear with us one moment before we kick off this amazing discussion on maternal mental health. little camera that sends requests. I think we're good. Okay, we're on. Hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Boppy channel. Um, my name is Laura Starling. I'm the chief of staff of Tot Squad. And um, I'm so pleased to be doing this webinar with Boppy. They are sponsoring this. Um, this webinar is all about maternal mental health. May is Maternal Mental Health Awareness Month. And so we are so pleased to have two experts here with us today, Kelly and Gabriella. And we're gonna get more into their bios and ask them lots of questions. First, I want to encourage everybody to please go to the link in the Tot Squad bio and register for the Boppy giveaway that they are doing. Um, <clears throat> It's so kind that they are doing this again to highlight their products. And then this very important month, the month of May is Maternal Mental Health Month. And that is why we've chosen to do this webinar today. Again, my name is Laura Starling. I'm from Tot Squad. Tot Squad is on a mission to normalize parents asking for support. We have over a thousand providers that we work with to connect them with parents, to give them bite-sized appointments in sleep, lactation, feeding and nutrition and car seat installation. You can purchase directly from our website or we've just recently launched with Walmart and lots more to come with that. So here with me today, I have Gabriella Kaufman. Gabriella, would you introduce yourself to us, please? Sure, I'm very excited to be here. So um, my name is Gabrielle Kaufman. I am uh, the clinical director for an organization clinical counselor. I am in private practice as well. I have been specializing in the field of perinatal mental health for I'm trying to think, 20, about 20 years. I'm also a board-certified dance movement therapist, and I'm on faculty at Drexel University and LA Arts and Healing Institute. And um, I love being here and the opportunity to discuss this with you all. I do believe supporting families has um, the, the opportunity, the possibility of, of changing the world. I, I feel that big about it. So I'm excited to be here with you and Kelly today. Thank you so much. And Kelly, would you please introduce yourselves to Bobby's audience? 
Sure, my name is Kelly Waisaki Emery, and I'm a registered nurse, and I'm a lactation consultant in IBCLC. Just it means you're board certified, and I have been helping moms breastfeed since '94. So, so it's been a long time on and off of helping. Well, mostly on of helping. I was a doula in the very early days of my career in the '90s, and that kind of transitioned. And I see moms for home visits or telehealth or I teach classes and, and just all of the things kind of kind of helping moms out there breastfeeding and pumping and all of it. That's awesome. Thank you ladies so much for being here to here today. Um, Tot Squad is proud to be a par part of Boppy's The Mom Kind Project. Boppy works to empower and support, educate and educate women throughout their journey of motherhood through the mom kind project they are educating mothers without judgment they are encouraging parents and mothers to have um safe practices and, em and empowering women through their motherhood journey i absolutely love that um i wish i had some of these resources when i had my children as well um so and if you are just joining us now please head to um, the Tot Squad page to enter the Boppy webinar, the Boppy webinar giveaway, and use the link to um, possibly win something from Boppy. So, with that being said, we're going to kick off our discussion today on maternal mental health. I wanted to share this quote with the audience before we start. In Glamour magazine, um, Ashley Graham just shared this. I'm a person, I am the person shouting from the rooftops, love the skin you're in. Yet for me, the birth of my children was a lot and put me out of that formula. The birth was incredible, but the aftermath was overwhelming. I felt sick, <laughs> I, felt I felt physically not myself and emotionally not myself. I had to reteach myself that I am bold, beautiful, and brilliant. So that quote really resonated with me. I'm a mom of a five-year-old and a one-year-old. I suffered definitely with postpartum anxiety with my first. So this is such a personal discussion for me personally. And I just wanted to you know, open it up and say, thank you for everyone being here. This is something that everyone wants to bring into light and talk about it because the aftermath of birth is a huge transition <laughs> for everybody. So, um, Gabriella, can this can your mental state be actually different from pregnancy to pregnancy with a first or a second or a third or a fourth child? Absolutely. You just said something about the big transition. I was I, I use this line often, which is there are very few times in your life you go into one place as one person and come out as two or three if you're having multiples. I mean, it, it's almost a bizarre thought process, right? I go into the hospital, I am one person, and I come out as two. So how could we not be transformed by that? So then you think about it from pregnancy to pregnancy, what we're doing every single time is changing our family structure. I kind of talk about it like we're two-dimensional if you have a couple. If you're in a couple, I don't presume that. But let's just say you're a couple, it's two of you, and all of a sudden you go to a triangle you add a third and then you add a fourth and you're a square. And then I'm not into geometry, so I can't give you all of the different shapes, but our whole family structure is constantly changing. So when it changes our relationship to our family, our relationship to ourselves, our understanding that quote you gave was so much about our kind of identity and the identity shift that we're constantly in and getting to a place in life where we feel I'm very comfortable with where I am. And then something very dramatic changes it. And so with it all changing, of course, our understanding of ourselves in the world changes. For some of us, and then for pregnancy by pregnancy, one thing I want to say is that I work with a lot of people who have suffered from a perinatal depression, pregnancy or postpartum depression or anxiety the first time. And then they are so frightened to get pregnant again and go through it again. But what they do have the second time around that they don't have the first time around is if they've received treatment, they know what works so that they can really say, so I say, you're not going into this as blind as you were the, sec the first time. You were going into it. You know what the transition did for you before. 
what are the things that work that you want to employ right now? How can you get your lactation support in line? How can you keep, by the way, if you're on medication and it's working, how can you stay on that and be supported throughout? If you know that that time of sleep is really difficult to you, what is available for you with sleep hygiene, right? How can you get that support? Where is tot squad? Where was tot squad? When I was <laughs> So all of those ways that it can be different pregnancy by pregnancy. Yes. And you, um, I mean, you hit on so much there that resonated with me personally. Um, I was scared to death my second time to get pregnant. But what I was encouraged by was that I knew the signs and I had a great team and people came around me and um, you know, it, it was amazing for me. The second time around was, was, was totally different. I'm really blessed, but it would be so helpful if you both can tell us a little bit about, you know, what are the signs pre and post that we should be aware of, um, and just keep top of mind. Um, are there some generalizations? I, I know that's like really hard to ask and it's person to person, but, um, Kelly, would you start us off by sharing some signs? And then, um, Gabriella, will you kind of tack on and, and, and let us know what we could be looking out for to help ourselves mentally and physically? Yeah, sure. I, and I will, you know, of course, defer to, to the doctor about um, more specific. I'm, as a lactation consultant, uh, what I see is um, people saying that they, they don't feel like themselves or they have, um, they're not eating well, they're not sleeping. When they, when they want to try to sleep, they just can't, their mind can't close off. They, 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 it, it's kind of an overall, like something is not right. They, they just don't feel themselves. And um, for me, I will tell you like th this, my first degree was psychology, like way back, you know, and I graduated in 1990. So uh, depression, anxiety, all that stuff has always been on my radar just because of my background. So when I help moms breastfeed, um, I'm always looking at that. And then when I'm in the peas offices or working with the OB or midwives, we're always screening for that with um, like this ad this tool. They're, they're thankfully nowadays being screened more for that. Um, but yeah, there's one thing, my, my personal story, if, if it's okay to share, um, is this is back in 91. Because I had no idea. We were not talking about this way back in '91 e either, and I just it was it, I I just kept having these recurring thoughts that I was going to hurt my baby. And it's you know she's 30 now, and it's and, and we talked about it, but it's it, it's very hard to talk about that sort of thing because I felt like such a bad mom um, having these feelings of actually having my like hurting my baby. And someone, I think it was like my OB or someone got me, recognized it, thank God, and got me hooked up with, with a therapist for the first time in my life. And she was so awesome because she said, you know, those people who are, those thoughts, those kind of intrusive thoughts, um, people rarely, they're, they're thoughts. They're not things that you're going to act on. So that was so, I just, that's all I needed to hear was this, what I was going through was normal and treatable and and then I wasn't a bad mom you know it was it was a super hard time but I, I see that and especially with breastfeeding I see moms kind of um, the anxiety piece of it I feel like it's the depression and anxiety it's kind of two sides of the same coin sometimes I see it um, come out as anxiety about breastfeeding issues and kind of perseverating about some things and it's 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 not easy it's not a walk in the park at all but but yeah, thankfully I was able to get hooked up with somebody. Thank you for sharing your personal story. I mean, I think, I hope more women will stand up and say like, hey, I've been there. You know, I've been there. I, I had intrusive thoughts. Like I thought I was a bad person. I thought I definitely was a bad mom. I was so tired in my personal experience. Like I had so many things that went wrong post-birth. I didn't give myself any credit. Um, until I was able to connect with, with, with someone that could guide me on the right treatment plan. Um, Gab Gabrielle, I just want to kick it over to you. What are some signs that you see pre and post? Um, and then once we address this, I want to move into like, how can we, how, how can the family support? And we'll get more into, in, into detail with that and looking forward into like what, what options are out there for everyone. I just want to first start by saying thank you, Kelly. The more people who tell their story, the more normalized this gets, the more people get help. 
And I want to say, God bless your doctor. <laughs> Because in 1991, there was no doctor who could detect postpartum OCD and what you described was OCD. So yeah. intrusive thoughts are more along the OCD spectrum. Um, there are psychotic thoughts, but that is not what happens when, when a mom feels very uncomfortable or scared or embarrassed or horrified or the word I hear the most is monstrous for having those thoughts. It's not psychosis. It's much more on the anxiety spectrum, and it's an intrusive. Mm -hmm. So that is a sign, and it's a serious sign, not serious because the mom is going to hurt her baby, but serious because of the distress it causes her. Mm -hmm. So bless your doctor, and your doctor said something <coughs> incredibly important, and I don't want to go over it quickly. I want to share this with you all. A thought is not an action. So I, how many of us have had thoughts we don't want anyone else to know about, I had one this morning, right? Um, don't have my husband. But yeah, I mean, we all have these thoughts that a thought is not an action. But when a thought becomes distressing and intrusive and interrupts our life, it is concerning in that it, it interrupts our ability to care for our children and to do what we need to do. So that's serious. Anxiety is a very common symptom of perinatal depression. And it's during pregnancy and postpartum. And often that anxiety is related to parenting. This feels so new and scary, and what if I'm doing it wrong? I can tell you how many of us feel like we're doing everything wrong all the time. A new mom particularly, <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my, my youngest is 16, and I'm doing, I'm doing everything wrong, I wanna tell you. But um, the learning curve of becoming a parent, I kinda of think of it as vertical, right? It's just, everything is brand spanking new for us, and we're so overwhelmed by these new, things that we're learning and it becomes so anxiety provoking. If that anxiety gets to the point it, it's interrupting your ability to get through your day, that is serious. Depression, and a depression looks different for every person. What I want to tell you is perinatal depression. So perinatal we think of as the time from pregnancy to postpartum. Perinatal depression looks different in every mom you talk to. We all represent those symptoms differently. But depression could be feeling sad. It could be feeling a little confused. It could be feeling just kind of blank and checked out. Another symptom to pay attention to, which we don't talk enough about, postpartum rage, is that kind of like surge of like seeing red that ta people talk about. Um, I think, you know, you said changes in eating and changes in sleeping, but the interesting thing, so in a general depression, you're looking at sleep and uh, eating changes. But one of the things that's, I think, confusing in the perinatal period is that the depression that um, gets in the way of our eating really results for most people in eating less. So then what happens? We lose weight. And then what does society tell us after we've lost weight, after we've had a baby? It's normal. <laughs> it's, no, not, not even it's normal. They, they tell us, oh, my God, you look gorgeous. Right? Yeah. They reinforce mm -hmm. it as opposed mm -hmm. to saying, if you're breastfeeding, you need, what is it? It's 500 extra calories a day. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating less and your baby is going to get that nutrition, whether it takes it from the food you're eating or your bones, that it drains us so much. So there's, I'm sorry, I'm go, I want to make sure I cover a lot of the symptoms because there's, there's so many of them. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and then the sleep loss too, it's not because your baby's not sleeping. It's because you're keyed up or anxious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, there are a bunch of other symptoms, but I think the ones that we often forget about are the anxiety, the rage, the confusion, even kind of the blankness. It's not just somebody who's sitting in a corner crying. That's sometimes, yeah. happens, but that's more rare. I would definitely agree with you, actually. Um, the more I spoke to my peers about, you know, suffering, what I had was postpartum anxiety to be completely, completely, um, to be completely direct. I've never told anyone that, um, I had, you know, I had the postpartum anxiety as well, but that's in that realm as I've learned. Mm -hmm. Um, to me, the more I talked to my peers about it, the more I realized I was not alone. And I think that's something that is so powerful because we live in a society that paints a very different picture for motherhood than what it really is. And I now know through getting support and getting help or learning is like motherhood is not the way I see it on Instagram. It's like in these days, like in the mornings where you can't shower, you're putting on your makeup, you're trying to do a thousand things, whether you have support or not, 
it's so important that motherhood is talked about, like, as we were sort of saying, like, it's a journey. It takes a village. You need to take care of yourself to, to be the best you can for your babies. So when we think about that, I would love to hear from you both. How do you get, like, if you're feeling like this, how do you get support from your your family, your spouse, your doctors, like what are, can we talk about some practical steps to like encourage um, women to, to move in the right direction post-birth? Kelly, do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always, always, always love to see partners um, come to my breastfeeding class because then it's four years and, you know, li listening to all of this, instead of just all on her. Like, so what, a lot of times because women have the breast, they think breastfeeding is all on them. And like, that's what most, that's what they do eight to 12 times a day. That's most, except for diaper changes, you're feeding a baby, especially if there's breastfeeding involved. And can so, I just say, it is intense. It's yeah. not like what they tell you. I mean, no. I had no idea. Like I, I had no idea and it is it is really intense and if you're pumping yeah. too if you're a pumping mom it's like you're pumping then you're mm -hmm. bottle feeding so I just wanted to say like yeah. it's a really it's a full-time job just to it be is. a breastfeeding and a pumping yeah. mother and a formula feeding mother because you are feeding that baby every two to three hours right babies have to eat whether it's breast or bottle or formula or anything they do have to eat quite often in the beginning and I think I think if the, um, the, you remember the, I don't know if you, they still do this was in the high school and they used to give you an egg and like the timer <laughs> would go out, like you had to take care of it and you <laughs> was supposed to deter teenagers, I guess, from having babies. I don't know, but, but it, but it gives you a better idea of like every you, there's no break. I think that's the mental break. If you go to work, you ate work from eight to five and then you get the evening off and then you get to sleep all night and you get to come back to your day job <laughs> the next day, but there's, there's just never a break. And that, I think it's kind of the mental load of, of real that setting in and realizing that this is not going to stop. This isn't just for two days and we're done. This baby wants to keep, is going to want to keep eating every single day. <laughs> so, and multiple times a day. So that, that sort of mental load. So your question, like of how can family or how can, you know, parents talk to others, definitely make sure that you're getting screened by your pediatricians do it now too. And also um, OBs. I'm seeing a lot of the, I work at six different pediatric offices too. So I know that they're being screened at like the two week mark. Just so there's another set of eyes on the situation. So it's not all on mom, like to figure out all of this um, for the, in, in terms of her mental health, but also the practical things like what, there's so much stuff that, that the partners can do, the families can do, the community can do. This doesn't have to be like a solo project that the mom has. Now she does have to, ask for help. Sometimes people, depending on our family dynamics, sometimes you have to be straight up and said, this is what I need. I need three meals, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I need these dropped off to my house. I don't want you to talk to me. I just want you to leave it on my front porch and text me when it's here. Like being very specific because people say, oh, just let me know how I can help. And then they just drop it. You know, there's, there's no specific. Now it's on the mom to figure out what she needs and then how to reach out for that. And it's just another mental to do that's another thing on our mental to-do list you know so so having having more of a community come together and letting her know that she's not alone this the survival of this baby is not just on her that everybody's here to help help buoy things up so i think i think that's that's something that the moms can and the whole the entire family can you know can preemptively do i had it even before the baby comes okay mm -hmm. gabriella what would you um I mean, I feel, I mean, what, what would you suggest for support? And I think Im importantly, maybe where we could start with you is with your partner, with your spouse. Like if you start to feel a certain way, do you have a, a best like approach to involve them in the discussions? And then outside of that, the support that you need to seek. So I have so many things to say. I want to go back to what you had said, Kelly, earlier on, is when mom doesn't feel like herself. That's so important because the truth is nobody knows us better than we know ourselves. And then when we get into places in our lives that feel dysregulating, overwhelming, confusing, we start to feel like we don't trust ourselves. 
one thing I would tell everybody is trust yourself. If you don't feel like yourself, you know. Um, the other thing I want, just kind of wanted to go back to you, what you had said, Kelly, as well, is that you work with pediatric offices that are doing screening. And the American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommends screening, but a lot of pediatric offices say, it's not my patient. But I have never met a baby who's gone into the office on their own. So if they are going in with the parent or the caregiver or whomever that person is, that relationship, that person's emotional wellness is going to impact that baby. So finding out about it is important. 100%. Um, I'm almost like losing what your question was, but partners as well. Okay. This is, this is something I tell clients all the time, which is lower your expectations. You know, 100%. We, <laughs> I think our like, expectations. Like, yeah. Yes. Well, I think that is, that is such great advice. Like you're not going to shower as much. It's like practical stuff. Like you're not going to shower like, yeah, lower your expectations. Like you're not going to be all straight there back to yourself. Like, like you said, you know, it's a transition. It's, it's almost like you're rebirthing a new identity. It, it, like, I don't know if people have told you that, like, that's what I refer to my process as is like, I'm not the same woman I was before. So, so I, I think like, big learning for me from one to two is lower your expectations. <laughs> so lower so I could get back to you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like I say to my daughter, like I gave birth to her, but she birthed a mom. Right. Yeah. So it's a big change. We're newborns together. And I got to tell you, I'm a therapist. So you already know that I F up my children. Right. So we're, we're learning on the job. We're learning what we're doing. We're, we're trying to build these things together and it's new lower our expectations stop looking at fake book right <laughs> um we spend so much time comparing and despairing and uh somebody like wrote that. i was noticing in the um chat book can can society's expectations of us or those comparison games cause postpartum depression i don't know causes the word but i certainly can know it contributes so so i almost want to say take Take a break from social media. Take a break from news. The news is globally depressing. And it's just like to take a break from it, surround yourself in things that feel good, and then also lower your expectations. Partners should lower their expectations. Do not ever come home and say to your partner, well, what did you do all day? <laughs> Unless you have a black eye, don't say that. Um, <laughs> Right. So there's that kind of sense of like, I just really feel like if we could be incredibly generous and open about this transition period and just really be open and loving, how different could it be for all of us to say, you know, you know, did you get to go to the bathroom without the baby today? That's a win. Right. Did you brush your teeth? <laughs> Hallelujah. Right. So where are the ways that we can be loving, accepting, and generous of spirit and, and step away from the expectation game. So I guess that's my advice. <laughs> and, you know, I have to say, purchase a boppy pillow, purchase something that's going to help you, you know, put the baby down just for a second safely. That's, that's, that's good. So, or do what I did, bring the, bring the boppy pillow into the bathroom so you can go to the toilet. You know, um, I'm just being, I'm just being real here, right? First time mom, I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, for my husband and I, we didn't have family immediately close by. Mm -hmm. Go onto the Tot Squad platform, draw down, draw down, spend, save and spend your money on getting in great connections with great providers like you both in, in lactation and feeding and diet and nutrition. We're now starting to also offer prenatal SKUs because we know how important that is. So now it's like there's these amazing support networks. And, and I mean, my hospital hosted a free breastfeeding support group. You know, they hosted all these free things that I went to because I was feeling lost, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think community is something I hear you both say is like um, open dialogue with your partner open dialogue with your family if you're not feeling like yourself. Um, 
and, and being specific with, I also hear you both saying like being specific with what the ask is. Like, I just need you to drop me off dinner tonight. I don't want you to stay. Not feeling like you have to entertain and that everyone needs to see the baby. I mean, we're in such different times than we have been in before. So I hear you guys saying both of those things. Um, I guess my other question, and I'm sure a lot of women have this in their mind. I feel like there's so much that happens hormonally post-birth. Can we, and I want to, Kelly, I want to ask you about breastfeeding and hormones, but um, Gabrielle, how do you see hormones fluctuating and kind of, does that play a part in, in like postpartum and, and where you're at? And could you share that with, with yeah. Bobby and their viewers? For sure. And I actually do want to shout out to Bobby. Bobby saved my life. I just want to say like <laughs> with, uh, I, I, and I definitely, my Bobby visited the bathroom. I just want to tell you that too. So <laughs> I just really love my Bobby. Um, yes, hormones play a huge role. We are, it's, it's, our bodies go through tremendous hormonal surges and changes on a regular cycle. And actually anybody, if you have follow your cycle and you notice that you tend to have PMS or PMDD, which is a uh, post, uh, is a premenstrual dysphoric disorder. If you suffer from that, you are at very high risk. And what that means is that your body is really impacted by monthly hormonal shifts and changes. Now, when you give birth, the changes in your body hormonally are like enormous. It's such an, such an enormous shift. So how would we not be impacted by that, right? Our hormones mm -hmm. impact our emotional state. But what I want to say is, Hormones can impact us going through changes no matter what. So dads, they go through a huge hormonal shift. Adaptive parents go through a huge hormonal shift. So we don't want to say to somebody, well, you didn't give birth, so you did not have hormonal changes and you are not going to struggle with mental health issues. That's not true. It's much more nuanced than that. And then there are other things to keep in mind. There are chemical changes in our body. There are inflammatory processes that change, that put us at higher risk for all kinds of health issues. There's lack of sleep, which can actually really um, fragment our ability to cope with anything. I mean, I, you, you know, when you're sick, what does the doctor say to you? Get a lot of rest. Why? Because rest helps us get better. It gives our body the ability to not focus on anything else and to focus on healing. But after we've given birth, we don't get that opportunity. So you take all of those components. You take also what's going on in your family. You take what's going on in the world. You may be dealing with financial insecurity. You may be dealing with uh, intimate partner violence. You might be dealing with a job change or a move or feeling, as you said, you were far away from your family. Like so many of those components. It, it's kind of like, you ever play the game Jenga? Yes. <laughs> and you start to take away all of those supports, there is no way that that Jenga game is going to not collapse. Yeah. So I don't know if that answered your question, but it's, it's a whole bunch of pieces. It does. I mean, I, you know, going through my own personal experience, I took a deep dive and read as many books as I could about the horm hormonal shifts in the body. And I'm not a doctor, but I was fascinated about it. I made it kind of my part-time passion <laughs> um, because I thought it was so important. And it was, again, an area that I wasn't educated on prior as a mom. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly, I would love mm -hmm. to hear from you. I mean, we've heard so many things about breastfeeding and hormones. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'd lo I would love to hear about fluctuation of hormones. Um, I know I had mastitis twice in six weeks with mm -hmm. my first, and it was, I then went to pumping full time. And then mm -hmm. with my second, it was a complete... I breastfed for three months, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I would love to hear from you, like hormone fluctuations and also can it be different from child to child? Oh, oh, very much so. I see that when I, when, well, you're a newbie at anything. Like, like I always say with a second baby, even mentally, like emotionally, all of that, you, it's not your first rodeo. So you're more prepared. You kind of know what you're getting into. And yes, with our second one, our milk tends to come in faster and more abundantly. And so that just, just, that's just the way our body works. And then that on top of you being more like mentally ready for this too, 
um, it can and having so many things set up ahead of time, then yeah, it can often go sm more smoothly with the second one. Not always, but yes, more smoothly with the second one. Um, and when you and then when you are if you're breastfeeding, yeah, and you're and then you start to wean, can there be her hormonal shifts with that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And sometimes it's a and and they're not quite sure like what's going on there, but it, it also can be a a mourning process. You know, like you're ready to wean, you do want to wean, you're you're done with this, but there's still some sadness, just like. Like you're breaking up with a boyfriend, you know, it's this, this relationship has ended, but there are still some good times you had, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that go into it, but yeah, but, but like, um, the doctor was saying that sometimes that, you know, just hormonal changes, especially if your body is, um, the cycling that you normally have, um, can affect you, then this can too. One of the things that I, a couple of things that I say when I'm, when I'm, well, I'll say three, like one hormone specifically is prolactin. You kind of talked about sleep. And when um, prolactin rises in the middle of the night, like in the wee hours of the morning. And so we know that um, when we get some sleep, our prolactin can rise. So like when you are running on fumes and you are not getting any sleep, that can affect your prolactin. That's the hormone that produces milk. Um, another one is vaginal dryness. Like that is something that's real. Like when you're breastfeeding and, you know, the estrogen is th not there. And then that can affect your, you know, it's your six week time and it is time to go back. That can affect your relationship as well. Um, if you guys aren't prepared for that and don't know that that's a normal side effect sometimes of, of breastfeeding hormonally. Um, and then there's, there's demer. I don't know if you've dealt with demer it's called it's dysphoric milk ejection reflexes so like sometimes when a mom has a and and a lot a lot of moms talk about this because again kind of like what i had it's kind of it's kind of a it's not a very popular thing to talk about but it's when you have a letdown so like when your oxytocin happens which makes your milk let down a couple yeah. minutes into the feeding you can have a huge drop in dopamine which which yeah. really makes you feel sometimes just nauseous sometimes irritated but sometimes every bad feeling you've ever had in your life comes rushing in and then it fades. It's not postpartum depression. You know, it, it fades, but, but it's very scary to women who don't know that this exists. They think, what the heck? Why? This is supposed to be a loving, wonderful time with my baby at the breast. Why am I feeling like, you know, I just want to crawl in a hole, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. So, so it's, it's a, it's a crazy, like miss, Mitch, you know, like mismatch of, hormones and neurotransmitters and society and then sore nipples on top of it like like you can only do pain oh. for so long you know like like you can do it for a little while but you're going on five six weeks of soreness it can wear you down i just yeah. want to say something if we can just be real for a minute like yeah. you hit on something really important like everybody talks about like that six week turning point whether you've had a vaginal delivery or a c-section and you know, you're, you want to be intimate again with your partner. I mean, for me, and I'm sure there's several other women out there. I like, I did not want to be touched. I felt like having a baby on my chest and around me, like at the end of the night, I kind of just wanted to like take a shower and be by yeah. myself. And I feel like part of birthing a baby is like talk, like what we're saying is like talking about these things and knowing that it's normal to mm -hmm. feel a certain way and you can have mm -hmm. that opinion mm -hmm. and like but also understanding you know what i'm learning from the both of you is that like your body does these things for a reason and there's a whole postpartum um area that maybe we you know we as a society can do a better job of educating our moms to make them feel a bit more normalized mm -hmm. so along that if you are, if you feel like you might be struggling or you have something on your mind postpartum, are there resources that are available to women or, that are, that are free or, you know, how, how do you go about asking for help and getting it? I'll answer first, but I'm sure you have your answers too. First of all, I really want to call out Postpartum Support International has now has a hotline, which is like, awesome. this is hot off the presses. We'll post it later because I think people should have that. 
Um, at Maternal Mental Health Now, we developed a free app. It has three avenues. I'm thinking about getting pregnant. I am pregnant. I've given birth. Um, and it's in English and in Spanish. And you can go through and then afterwards you develop your own kind of plan. And included in it are signs and symptoms, asking for help, and what helps you get by, right? Some real basic tools. Um, and I think part of part of what I've learned along the way is the more we share stories, we we can feel like it's safe and healthy and accepted. I'm just kind of like we're doing today, you know, the, uh, the more we can even talk about vaginal dryness. I know that sounds like it's, it, it doesn't sound like, you know, pop, popular talk, cocktail hour conversation, but nobody mentioned lubricant to me. Like what a... <laughs> What a lifesaver, right? And we don't think about that. And I'm actually, I want to thank you for mentioning Deemer, Kelly, because even in the circles that I work in, that's still newer to talk about. And it's mm -hmm. shocking to people. And then it builds something even worse, which is resentment of the parent to the baby. And that can be dangerous. So there are so many things that we just need to be talking about more. So those are some of the resources I think that are great. Um, there are... Uh, Postpartum Support International also has free support groups. So just go to postpartum.net. You can find a lot of information there. That's amazing. Kelly, anything mm -hmm. you would want to add to that? I love PSI, um, Postpartum Support International as well. It's, it's, it's just a quality, up-to-date um, organization. Yeah, okay. I, I echo that. I echo both of those things. Um, <laughs> I also echo, like like I said to you guys, being able to share, talk to your doctor, ask for a referral. Um, you know, in my case, this was just what worked for me. I said, I'm not feeling like myself and I wanna to talk to a psychologist. I wanna to talk to a therapist. And I knew that much and that was enough to sort me on the right path. I had a long path ahead of me. <laughs> um, but again, I community, I hear you guys saying like community resources, talking to other women, talking to other parents, um, reaching out to people. I mean, one of the greatest things I love about social media is people can reach out and they can connect and you can connect in so many, you know, sounds like so many great different ways. And there's now actually organizations that, that thrive and exist for this purpose. And there's, and there, there's, there's a month now devoted to this, which is so exciting to bring awareness to it. Um, Again, I, um, if you have not registered for the giveaway, please do so. Boppy is giving away some great um, thoughts and gifts to sponsor this amazing webinar. Um, before we wrap up for today, um, Gabrielle, do you have any last closing thoughts that you would like to share? Gosh, so much. This has been a really exciting conversation. And it just, every time I get this chance and to meet you, Kelly, it's been really a lovely experience. Yeah. Well. Um, ask for help. Be specific in what you need. If you don't get help the first time around, find somebody else. Therapy works. It helps. It's nice to have somebody to talk to. Your friends don't have to be your therapist. But if you can't get a therapist, I mean, here's the ideal. You get a therapist who has been specialized and gone through special training. But if you can't, figure it out. Find your pastor. Talk to your pastor. I have to say there's a lot of great pastoral care out there. Um, find things that help support you, but don't, don't be deterred if the first person you reach out to doesn't understand or give you what you need. Cause I got to tell you, we're out there. You know what? I went to three different people before I met the right person for me mm -hmm. and I stayed at it and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. And my doctor kept encouraging me, like, find the right person, Laura, find the right person. And um, I just, I just love that. And um, Kelly, I have, uh, Kelly, I want to give you an opportunity. And then I'm being told we have more time if you guys can stay on because we've got some, it looks like we've got some questions too. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give Kelly you an opportunity to kind of have some closing remarks. And then we're going to take questions from everyone. Sure. Yeah, I, I would say um, my closing remark would be kind of this, you know, again, echoing, but also to say that um, breastfeeding, I know it, 
a lot of times moms say oh, it's supposed to hurt in the first two weeks and then and then it gets better and sometimes it does but i i see moms who are really suffering out there when when they don't need to be and then um getting some help getting some qualified lactation help of finding a way because yes there's a little discomfort but if you're cracked and bleeding and like like things are really really bad you're dreading feeding something some some you need some help does um do does like the health savings fund um um does will that can you use that towards lactation and therapy yeah. as well all i don't know about therapy but i know for lactation under the affordable care act it is supposed to be a covered benefit unless you have a grandfather plan but it's so it's supposed to be no copay no deductible um for for you for if you have a health savings plan i mean they should cover it. your insurance cover it, but it, other than that yes your um hsa qualifies for sure yeah same thing with therapy but you know health mental health parity means that mental health treatment should be covered but every insurance is different and unfortunately as a mental health clinician i can tell you i've never been busier in my life we're at a bit of a mental health crisis mm -hmm. um but so what fine just stick to it be your greatest advocate. Oh, here's the other thing I tell people. If you can't do it for yourself, do it for your baby. Do it for your, yeah. Do it for the well-being of your family. Yeah. Sometimes 100%. we don't feel, don't, sometimes we feel down on ourselves. Okay, I wish you didn't, but do it for your baby. And then eventually you'll recognize how important you are. For sure. And, um, I'm just seeing some questions come through. The importance of having a, I mean, a lot of like routine, <laughs> mm -hmm. the importance of having a routine, like when you kind of have your baby at a good place routine wise, how important is it for a mom to have a routine and still maintain some things that they love to do, whatever their love would be? <laughs> how, how important is that for, for, for moms? I mean, I'm just going to say it depends person by person. Some people really thrive in structure. And if you're that person, then you need to, uh, it, it feels, for some people, it feels like they have more control with structure. I really believe in balance. So having some structure with a little flexibility can go a very long way. If you say, if my baby doesn't get fed at the exact, you know, at, at two o'clock and three minutes, then ev everything will go downhill then you get into an anxious state. But if you can say, I really want to keep it to some general structure, um, I think it, it can feel both comforting and remove the anxiety. So it really is about balance, is what I would say. I always encourage, oh, sorry. I, I always encourage moms to put themselves on the to-do list as well, like, and finding something that they used to do. It's funny when I ask them, what, what did you used to do before being a mom? And they have to pause a minute, like, to remember who they were, mm -hmm. like, say her name, Sarah, and like, who was Sarah, like, six months ago? And what did she like to do? And it's like, oh, you know, they have to kind of think back about that, you know, if it was a Saturday afternoon, I think I'd be reading in that little, my favorite chair over there, reading my favorite book or whatever, but you don't have time to do that. But putting yourself on your to-do list is, um, I think, important. My, my therapist once said to me, like, you have to put your oxygen mask on first yeah. before yeah. you can put everybody else's yeah. mask on. So um, true. Mm -hmm. But it's so funny how we, we, we just don't see it like that sometimes, like in the, in the early, especially in the early days, like yeah. the early healing days. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about, whilst we have time, because we're getting some questions, how, how is it best for if a mom is going, because I know there's a lot of women that are in this position, you know, women are going back to work, they're having babies, they're going back to work, they want to go back to work. How do, how do you guys, Kelly on the breastfeeding side, side prepare a mom to go back to work, and then um, Gabrielle on the, on, and, and like on the mental side, how do you, how do you prepare yourself? Kelly, do you want to kick us off first? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I have, there's the logistics that I can kind of work them through, like to, about how many ounces you need, blah, 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 all that stuff. But, but it really, I think the meta mess, like the, when they're, when they're asking me these questions, I think there's a, there's like how, what they're really wanting to know is how can I leave my baby for eight hours a day? <laughs> you know, and, and 
they're they're working on these things but i know in the background is running this like okay well, how am i going to leave what am i going to do if you know i i can't smell my baby every two hours or like do this or is my baby going to want to nurse again when we come back together so many just unanswered questions that i think can be very unsettling you know and once you get back you get into a routine but the on the just the scariness of the unknown is is hard so sometimes I often recommend that they do like a dry run with their daycare um, before their actual go back to work day so they can kind of, even if it's for two hours or four hours leaving their baby and then kind of inch into it and see what it kind of is going to look like. Then it's not such a big scary day the first day that they go back. Mm -hmm. um, so if they, if they do have to be separated from their baby, then it's, they, they kind of worked out some of the details and the logistics, but um, but typically getting, getting, you know, if you know that your baby's going to have to make friends with a bottle and going to have to have a bottle, then getting, getting a plan in place for doing that and getting a little bit of a freezer stash going. So you, cause you need to draw at that for your first day. Um, so it depends on if they're going to work full time or part time. We go over the logistics about what that is, but, but I think it's, I think moms just want to talk through it because it's so unknown. I, I think they want to kind of get a mental picture of how this is going to be. Because my day right now is I stay in my jammies all day and we sit on the couch, we nurse, we do this, we diaper, you know, and then now it's going to be, I got to get dressed and I got to drive to work and I got to whatever, do my job, you know. So, mm -hmm. so Gabrielle, how, how from a mental stand, a mental perspective, so spiritual that, perspective do we get prepared <laughs> when it comes to going back to work the two words that i hear the most are grief and guilt the two g's mm. so there's some grief that comes from am i leaving my baby am i you know so there's there's like that sadness or what this is like and i love the idea of the dry run i think that's really wonderful i also like to say what do you want to bring with you like do you want to print a picture of your baby do you want mm. to we talk about transitional objects for babies you know you want to leave a blankie with your baby well what about a blankie for you mm -hmm. how about that blankie that you guys snuggle with that you could put in your purse and touch you know throughout the day like finding those things and then the word guilt is so prevalent when i think about working moms so i'll just tell you i look at it as like the guilt with no open door every door closes off so if you go to work and you leave your baby and you feel sad about leaving your baby, you feel guilty. If you go to work and you don't feel sad about leaving your baby because you really like to go into work, you feel guilty. If you're at work and not able to focus on your work because you're thinking of your baby, you feel guilty. If you're at work and not able to, uh, to think about your baby because you're focused on work, you feel guilty, right? Do, do you see what I'm talking about? Like it's lose, lose, lose across the board. So what I want to just say, and this is similar to what I said earlier, which is lower our expectations. Be gentle, recognize that going back to work might not be what it used to be. Recognize that it is absolutely okay to say, I love working. And it's also really okay to say, I hate working. Like all of those things are okay. And being accepting, I think goes a long way. Yeah. I mean, I know for, I know for so many, like, look, I love to work, you know, I mean, it is who I am. It's part of my fabrication. I had a really hard time um, saying that out loud with my first because of guilt. Um, but the truth is, I'm a better mom working. Like, that is my truth. That's not the same for everybody else. But saying my truth out loud, I know empowers other people to feel the same way. And just like saying your truth out loud and saying that you're struggling with something empowers, I think, other women to be aware and feel like they can embrace that too. And I love the fact that these conversations are happening more now. And, and just like, you know, like more so than ever, I can ring up a friend and say like, today's been really tough. Like in this moment, this day's been really tough. I have a crazy five-year-old who I love and I've got a crazy one-year-old and like they're running around the house and you know nothing's getting done and I think just having that community to say that is like such such a relief and for for some people it's their family they can talk to like that and for others it's you know it's their friends um and the allies around them mm -hmm. 
I just want to say, um, if you haven't had a chance, please click the Tots God link in bio to register for um, the Boppy giveaway. Many people are asking, so that's where you can do that. Um, we'd love to have everyone register that's on, that's um, listening for the giveaway. They're giving away some great products. Thank you so much, Boppy. Um, I guess as we look forward, what do you what do you both think the future holds for mental health awareness during the postpartum period? Can you guys talk a little bit to that? Go ahead, Gabrielle. <laughs> okay. Well, so here's what I'll say. I have been specializing in the field of perinatal mental health for about uh, 15 years, 15 to 20 years. And I will tell you, just as uh, Kelly said earlier, this was not something people were talking about before. I remember when I said this was what I was really focusing on in my practice and, in, and in, at the nonprofit and with Postpartum Support International, and people were like, that's not really a thing, right? So nowadays, nobody says that. Nowadays, we've got celebrities, bless their souls, who come forward and say, this was really hard for me. I had postpartum depression or anxiety. So I think we have a really good future ahead. I'm very encouraged. I'm really encouraged that mental health is something people are talking about with less shame. It's not gone and there's still a lot of stigma, but we are in, I kind of feel like the wind is at our backs. Okay. I agree awesome. 100% I, from, from 30 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you. I cannot thank you both. You are both amazing providers, you know, um, Kelly to us at Tot Squad, we're so, we're so blessed to have you. Um, and Gabriella, friend now of ours as well. Um, and being able to work with you has been an absolute pleasure and share this important topic with um, Boppy's community. Um, I think the most, the thing that maybe we can leave um, our audience with today is just um, one, you're never alone. Mm -hmm. Two, these things, no, no race, no color, no gender, no nothing. Dads can even go through this from an article I was reading earlier. Um, and that there is a whole community out there. That's what I've learned from you both today. That's there and willing and able to support. And there's great companies like Boppy and Tot Squad that are bringing light to this and joining forces and on the Boppy side, creating incredible products to help, you know, families through that postpartum period. And on the Tot Squad side, providing services to help mm -hmm. parents through all sorts of, all sorts of stuff, um, not just limited to, to newborn um, postpartum interaction anymore. There's a whole, there's a whole land. Um, any closing remarks, guys, from, from you, ladies? I guess to say there's a lot of hope. You can get better. And I do... I also want to say, I wish Tot Squad was around when I was a parent. Um, so thankful that it exists. Mm -hmm. And Bobby was around and I really used it. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly? Yeah, I, I would say the same. Thanks for doing what you're doing and bringing um, awareness to this. It's, that's really awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And again, it's let's normalize parents and people asking for support and help. Like, it is, it's life-changing. It really, really is. And um, having the right community is, is so important. Motherhood, parenthood is not meant to be done alone. That's what I've learned today um, from both of you. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Boppy, for sponsoring this event. Please enter the giveaway. It's in our link in bio on uh, Top Squad. Um, and Kelly, Gabrielle, thank you so much. Thank you. I cannot thank you guys enough. It's been an absolute pleasure. And anyone who wants to uh, join us on Instagram, it's Maternal Mental Health Now. So come and join us and find out what we're doing. We, we, we want to join up. Have a great day. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Thank you both. Thank yeah. you again. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Bobby.